This message comes from NPR sponsor Mint Mobile. From the gas pump to the grocery store, inflation is everywhere. So Mint Mobile is offering premium wireless starting at just $15 a month. To get your new phone plan for just $15, go to mintmobile.com slash switch. Hello, hello. I'm Brittany Luce, and you're listening to It's Been a Minute from NPR, a show about what's going on in culture and why it doesn't happen by accident. A warning, this segment includes sexual references and frank talk about sex. This week, we're connecting the dots between a podcast network, one girl's triple X advice, and one million beers. I know, I know. How are all these things connected? Well, we're going to find out with Slate's Luke Winky and writer Magdalene Taylor, who covers sex and culture. Luke, Magda, welcome to It's Been a Minute. It's good to be here. Thanks so much for having me. It's good to have you both. All right, when I say hawk, you say... Tuh. You got it, Luke. (laughs) (laughs) That, of course, is a reference to the viral sensation known as Hawk Tua, which, if you missed it, I'm going to try and give you the most public radio explanation for it that I can. Do y'all think I can do it with no bleeps? I mean, you're the professional, so I, I assume this is not your first rodeo with stuff like this. This is the first time since I've been working in public radio, I think, that we have had to explain something quite this detailed, but uh, (laughs) all right. So this all started with this street interview video. It's a popular social media trend where a person with a microphone runs up to someone on the street and asks them a question. In this instance, it was these young guys, Tim and Dee, who ran up to like a college age blonde girl outside of a bar in Nashville and asked her, quote, what move in bed makes a man go crazy every time? To which Haley Welch responded, you got to give him that hawk tour and spit on that thing. What's one move in bed that makes a man go crazy every time? Oh, you you got to give him that hawk tour and spit on that thing. You get me? (laughs) So if you don't know what she's spitting on, I kindly suggest you to Google it for yourself. I do not have the time or energy to get into all that here. Plus, I don't really want to talk about what was said I want to talk about why it went viral and how Haley Welch, now known as the Hawk Tua girl, is like this tip of an iceberg of an online culture that's both culturally and politically powerful, and one that I think many folks try to avoid and maybe shouldn't. But to start, I'm curious. Luke, you've written about the Hawk Tua phenomenon, and Magda, you write a lot about sex and culture online. When did both of you first encounter the meme, and when did you realize it was a thing? I first saw it at a point where it was already being made into hats. There was already (laughs) merchandise with Hawk Tua on it. So it already exploded. Well, the merchandise came almost immediately after it picked up as a viral phenomenon. It was, Mm -hmm. it was rapid. Hmm. Luke, what about you? Yeah. Yeah. I I guess maybe I'm maybe more on this side of the internet than I'd like to believe because it was like (laughs) trending nonstop on my Twitter account for like days after the fact. But like Magda, I I pretty quickly saw like, you know, there are tattoos coming out, the hats, the merchandising, the bumper stickers. It became pretty clear to me that this was going to be a pretty galactic size meme that was going to make it all the way to NPR (laughs) in a couple of weeks. (laughs) I mean, my husband and I, we like have a lot of overlap in the things that we're interested in, the things that we like, the things that we follow online. A lot of times our social algorithms are like almost the exact same. They'll be super synced up. Like we can be scrolling through our feeds and see the exact same TikTok at the exact same time. But Hawk Tua was like this anomaly. I don't really know why he got it and why I never saw it <laughs> until he pointed it out to me. My hypothesis is that his phone knows that he's like a man between the ages of 25 and 45. And they were like, you're like this. But I don't know, when I saw it, and I saw how huge it was, and how my phone, nowhere in any of my social media apps was this like, anywhere making waves. It kind of felt like I was dipping into this other social media silo, a glimpse into like another social media universe. And in this case, this part of the internet comes with a name. The writer Max Reed calls it the Zinternet. The Zin of Zinternet being a reference to the Zin nicotine pouches that have become popular in frat culture. The Zinternet is all about frat adjacent culture, everything from college sports to light beer. I'm curious, how would both of you define this online Zinternet slash 
online frat culture? Like, what are its defining characteristics or examples of it? Yeah, um, Max Reed in the story you mentioned really nails it when he says that these internets is dominated by a variety of different kind of disparate media entities that are all like sponsored by like sports gambling. I think that's a good like kind of framework. <laughs> We're talking various college sports podcasts. We're talking about these guys that do these kind of man on the street interviews. So it's, it's kind of raunchy. It's kind of profane. And it's reminiscent of kind of like a early 2000s style kind of media imprints. Mm. Tucker Max comes to mind. Oh my gosh. Things of that nature. Here's Tucker Max being interviewed on Fox News almost two decades ago. The book is called I Hope They Serve Beer in Hell. And frankly, there is not much in it that can be repeated on a nice family show. Tucker, this chronicles kind of these wild nights with women drinking, et cetera, et cetera. Is it true? Is all of it true? I mean, it's it's all very true. It's I, I'm not even the coolest one of my friends. I'm just the guy who sat down and wrote everything down. So, which is to say, it, it's like kind of broadly conservative or like MAGA adjacent, but it's still like apolitical at the same time. It's like, it's just sort of been kind of coded as conservative without being really like acutely hmm. political. Magda, I know for you, one prime example of this internet is this trend called the one million beers. What What is that? It's one of those really deceptively simple and stupid trends where... <laughs> Whatever beverage you might think you want, you go to a bar and you order a gin and tonic. Actually, you're wrong. You don't want either of those things. You want one million beers instead. That's the whole joke? That's basically the whole joke, but it is also paired with one of those (laughs) ultra handsome filters that gives you, you know, a really chiseled face and a perfect set of teeth. Oh, yeah, like just the right amount of stubble. Yes, exactly, exactly. Which, who doesn't? Oh, my gosh. To kind of expand on the Hawk to a multiverse a little bit, when I first saw the video, this pretty blonde girl talking about oral sex, I instantly thought of the Call Her Daddy podcast, which has allegedly like 10 million listeners per episode and was started by these two young white women who talk a lot about their sex lives. And very early on in the show, early on in their podcasting careers, they coined the term Gluck Gluck 9000, which, (laughs) like Hawk Tua, is an oral sex reference. Call Her Daddy, which was part of the Barstool Sports Podcast Network, which was acquired by Penn Gaming in 2022 for nearly $400 million, just to give you an idea of how valuable this network is and how valuable this audience is. And of course, the Hawk Tua girl was interviewed on a Barstool Sports Podcast called Plan Bree, hosted by a girl named... (laughs) Brianna. <laughs> and I don't know, there's a lot going on here with the pockets there are for women or the kind of women that are in this kind of like Zinternet space. H- how do women fit into the Zinternet? Like what makes a Zinternet woman? I think that a, a Zinternet woman is somebody who embodies this Spike TV, 20 years old, I hope they serve wow. beer in hell type of ideology that we've been talking about. Like the man show that used to come on Comedy Central. Yes. This very nostalgic frat type of culture without any sort of feminism to it, to, to be blunt. You have to kind of make yourself very ultimately sex positive, hmm. sort of organically sexually liberated to men's standards. Hmm, 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 hmm. You know, I think that this internet also butts up closely to other cultures that many people are very familiar with, the American political right and the manosphere. Take, for example, Marjorie Taylor Greene tweeting that a crackdown on Zen nicotine pouches would be cause for, quote, a Zen surrection. Or take Tucker Carlson, who uses them, to quote him, Every second he's awake because he says it, quote, increases mental acuity and raises your testosterone level. I should add that nicotine does have health risks, but it's this combination of manosphere ideas of finding the most efficient ways to be the manliest man sidled up next to conservative political commentary. I know you thought a lot about the ways in which this Zinternet culture sits adjacent to a political culture. You know, this internet seems to want to avoid explicit political commentary or references to the news. But at the same time, Trump is winning with people who explicitly say they don't follow the news. This is the group of people who say they're just online to have fun. He's winning that demographic by 26%. Yes. This kind of thinking that 
you are not political or that you don't really follow politics is by many people's interpretations indicative of a politic in itself. Something like drinking beers or participating in a fraternity, golfing. All of these are things that I think we see as very upper middle class white, but also conservative. So there's, you know, a lot of different political layers to that alone. But part of the appeal to all of this is that it isn't outwardly framing itself as political in one direction or another. And I think that that's part of why people are enjoying leaning into this so much is because they are kind of exhausted by the sense of policing over their interests and their actions toward a political end. Yeah, I think we're living in a time right now that if you define yourself as apolitical or not very political or someone that does not read a lot of political news, just mm-hmm. by that nature, that kind of puts you under this this more conservative umbrella. I feel like people on the left, their experience of being online or their experience of politics is you know, full of a lot of anxiety and rage. And a lot of that's really understandable and earned. But I do think we lose sight that there are a huge amount of people in this country who mostly want to get on the internet and have fun and make their sports parlays or laugh at hawk to all this stuff. And when I delve into his internet corners, like where I kind of detect politics is this sort of nostalgia for a time when the only thing that the world was worrying about is whether or not they could drink 1 million beers or not. Right. Mm -hmm. There is a spike TV nostalgia that that was like kind of a simpler time. Hmm. Yeah. I think that that's sort of a dominant element of conservative cultural politics is nostalgia. And we are just at a point culturally where that nostalgia speaks to Tucker Max and Spike TV and Maxim Magazine and a very bro <laughs> type of culture. But at the same time, I do think we're probably escalating the political perspectives around it by having all of this like philosophizing about what it all means. Because again, as we've been saying, so much of what people want right now is to evade that entirely. Like to not think about it too hard. Yeah. Yeah. On its face, this is a, a fun, charming, kind of puerile clip of a young woman being kind of splashy about what she likes to do in bed Mm -hmm. and being, you know, in some ways, like really kind of open about her sexuality and being unapologetic about it. And the fact is that has immediately become coded as conservative or like a win for Republicans or that she's going to be this MAGA character, you know, like immediately that sort of happens. And when I consider the full scope of what like a Trump election would mean in 2024 and all the curtailing of all these different sexual freedoms and sexual identities, all that stuff. It just Mm -hmm. seems crazy and incoherent to me that a moment like that is immediately lumped into under, under this umbrella. You know, to bring all this back to the hawk to a girl, one thing that stuck out to me in your analysis before this conversation, Magda, uh, she is in some ways the antithesis of many contemporary representations of women's sexuality. Like, yes, she is being open with talking about her sexuality. She's unafraid to answer this question. She doesn't seem ashamed, which I think, you know, that that seems like a pretty progressive thing. But she's also centering male pleasure in her description of, you know, what makes a good time in bed. I think there's this idea, false or otherwise, that the liberal woman would never perform the hawk to a, that it wouldn't be (laughs) feminist of her to do that. Which is something that we see less and less of in popular culture, especially in like vanguard popular culture right now. Things that uh, maybe the types of movies, TV shows, sex scenes that kind of push culture where it's going to go. Uh, We're much more likely to see men centering women's pleasure and to see those things as positive. That kind of feels like the hot trend at the moment. I mean, honestly, you kind of see that all up and through Bridgerton, even something as like hugely popular and as mainstream as it can really get. I wonder, what does the Zinternet's embrace of the hawk to a girl say about their attitudes towards young women, like what they want from women and what they fear about women? I think that it demonstrates that this internet does not necessarily have the most cohesive set of desires about women. I think that Hmm. 
that's true for so many corners of our culture that we don't know exactly what we want from women and it's it's filled with contradictions. But I would say broadly, the Zinternet wants a cool girl kind of down to the whole, uh, that, that gone girl monologue of what a cool girl <laughs> yes. is, who very much enjoys sex. She's open and cool about sex, but isn't actually necessarily trying to sell us something in that regard, hasn't made it a feminist identity, hasn't politicized it, which I think is kind of an, an overarching theme of a lot of this, this internet is the wanting to enjoy sex, drinking beers, sports, and not over-intellectualizing the enjoyment of these simple pleasures, which I think, frankly, is a, a very reasonable desire. Mm, mm. Well, regardless of our thoughts on all this, the uh, hawk to a girl, Miss Haley Welch, has now landed herself a manager and is already selling merch. Regardless of the situation, she has managed to capture all of our attention all the way to the bank. The hawk to a podcast is right around the corner. I'm sure. <laughs> right around the corner. And you know what? I'm sure it'll do numbers. Well, Luke, Magdalene, thank you so much. I have learned so much here. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thank you so much. And as a thank you, I'd like to teach you something by playing a game with you all. Can you stick around for a tiny bit longer? Of course. Absolutely. All right. We'll be right back with a little game I like to call, What Did You Know? Stick around. This message comes from NPR sponsor, Sattva. Founder and CEO Ron Rudson shares the experience they hope to create in their viewing rooms. We want our customers to feel like they've walked into a luxury hotel. That's what Safa has been inspired by from the day that we started. We take sleep very seriously. We believe it unlocks a superpower if you get the right sleep on the right mattress. We believe we can provide that. To learn more, go to SAATVA.com slash NPR. This message comes from NPR sponsor Discover. It's good to share helpful knowledge, so here's a tip that could be doubly helpful. Discover will automatically double all the cash back you've earned on your credit card at the end of your first year with Cashback Match. Get rewarded no matter who you are or how much you spend with Discover. It pays to Discover. You could even say it double pays to Discover. They won't stop you. See terms at discover.com slash credit card. This message comes from NPR sponsor Progressive Insurance, where drivers who switch could save hundreds on car insurance. Get your quote at Progressive.com today. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. This message comes from NPR sponsor Warby Parker. Their glasses start at $95, including anti-reflective, scratch-resistant prescription lenses that block 100% of UV rays. Try five pairs of frames at home for free. Go to WarbyParker.com slash covered. All right, all right. We're going to play a little game I like to call, But Did You Know? Here's how it works. I'm going to share a story that's been making headlines this week. And as I give you some background on the story, I'll also ask you trivia related to it. But don't worry. It's all multiple choice. So the right answer is somewhere in the mix. And the first one to blurt out the right answer gets a point. Person with the most points wins and their prize is bragging rights. Are y'all ready? Yes. I'm ready. So there's been a lot of conversation since the presidential debate about whether or not President Biden should still be running for president. And with that has come a lot of chatter about who would replace him were that to happen. The obvious and I guess viral choice has been Vice President Kamala Harris, who has had moments from her career being memed all across the internet over the past week. So today I want to highlight those memes and see if you all know where they came from. The first being this meme, which features a photo of Kamala Harris pointing behind her with the caption, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this coconut tree. (laughs) What coconut tree is being referenced here? Is it A, a real coconut tree Kamala sat under while on vacation in Hawaii? B, a metaphorical coconut tree Kamala's mother spoke of when Kamala was a kid? Or C, a digital coconut tree from when Kamala played Mario Kart on the campaign trail and couldn't get around. She just kept smashing into it, just like me. Which is it? It's B. It's B. The answer is B. It's gotta be B. Luke said it first. The answer is B, a metaphorical coconut tree. At a White House event in 2023, Kamala Harris remembered her mother saying to her, I don't know what's wrong with you young people, 
You think you just fell out of a coconut tree? <laughs> she went on to add this from her mother. You exist in the context of all in which you live and what came before you. And by how quickly the two of you answered, I would wager a bet that you've seen these memes before. Yeah, I didn't even know it was exactly a story about her mother. I just knew it was a, a metaphorical coconut tree that some of us think we, we fell out of, but turns out we didn't. <laughs> <laughs> we did it. We come in the context of all that came before us. Oh my gosh. All right, time for our next Kamala meme. In a viral video of Kamala Harris, she talks about this one thing that she absolutely loves. She's actually said many, many times that she loves this thing. What is this thing? Is it A, spreadsheets, B, timetables, or C, Venn diagrams? C. Let's see. Venn diagrams. Well, Magda, it's good you're so fast on that because the answer is in fact C, Venn diagrams. I love Venn diagrams. At multiple events, Kamala Harris declared her love for the elementary visual. I really do. I love Venn diagrams. It's just something about those three circles and the analysis about where there is the intersection, right? Do we too love Venn diagrams? I mean, <laughs> as one can. <laughs> what's, what's not to like? What's not to like? I'll say, uh, I'm not one to be able to necessarily read a chart or a graph, but a Venn diagram. <laughs> Boom. It makes sense. Get it. Off yeah, that's true. Yeah. It's pleasing the eyes. All right. I love to see them. All right. So to recap the score, Luke, you're at one point. Magda, you're at one point. So we've got a tiebreaker here. All right. Without further ado, the final question. Another video of Kamala Harris has been memefied, and it's a special recipe for which of these American Thanksgiving classics? A, roast turkey. B, green bean casserole. C, mashed potatoes. This is a deeper cut. I don't know this one. Yeah, I'm actually not sure, but I'm going to go with B. I'm going to go mashed potatoes. C, mashed potatoes. Well, I'm sorry to both of you. No <laughs> one's winning today because the answer is A, roast turkey. Wow. That just seemed too obvious. In this video, Kamala Harris is waiting for a TV interview to begin. And like on the side, she's giving advice for how to cook a Thanksgiving turkey. A pot of water, a couple of bay leaves, a little sugar, a little pep cup of peppercorns. Um, you could even do a little slice of orange, something like that. Oh, yes. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm here. I mean, turkey's a hard thing to cook. The way she laid that out, I was like... These are the paths laying in front of Kamala. It's next president or write, write, a, yeah. <laughs> write a cookbook. President cookbook. Mm. Which is it? Which could it be? <laughs> All right. That's it for But Did You Know for this week. And we are left with a tie, which means we're going to need both of you to come back soon for a sudden death tiebreaker because we just left things on a cliffhanger. That's right. Hopefully uh, another viral Instagram clip pops up soon <laughs> yeah that we can, we can weigh can in discuss. on <laughs> magdalene luke thank you both so much for joining me today yeah thanks for having us thank you so much that was slate's luke winky and writer magdalene taylor i'm gonna take a quick break and when i get back we're getting into another american icon the cowboy and why the lone ranger is more relevant than ever stick around this message comes from NPR sponsor, REI Co-op. For the next half minute, REI wants to remind you that you can't make more time, but you can make the most of it by calling Time Out. Time Out on the algorithms, comfort zones, and life on autopilot. REI believes that getting outside is the best way to get out of our routines and instead find new routes. When you're ready, they have the gear, clothing, classes, and advice to get you started. Visit your local REI co-op or REI.com forward slash opt outside. This message comes from NPR sponsor Squarespace. Kickstart or update written content on any website, product description, or email with Squarespace AI, generating instant personalized results that know and show your brand identity. Explain what your site is about, choose your tone, and enter what you need to get short or long-form text. No matter the placement, Squarespace AI makes it easier to go live, stand out, and succeed online. Use code NPR to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. 
This message is brought to you by NPR sponsor, Progressive Insurance. You call the shots on what's in your podcast queue. Now you can call them on your auto insurance too with the Name Your Price tool from Progressive. Tell Progressive how much you want to pay for car insurance and they'll show you coverage options within your budget. Get your quote today at Progressive.com. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Price and coverage match limited by state law. This episode's sponsor is Carvana, which offers the following message. Whether you're looking to sell your car in a hurry or thinking about parting ways with your trusty ride, Carvana is the convenient way to sell your car. Go to Carvana.com to get an offer for your vehicle in seconds. We are in the heat of summer, and we just celebrated one of the most American of holidays, July 4th. And that made me think of one of the most American of symbols, the cowboy. (laughs) Yes, indeed. I always see so many cowboy hats at July 4th celebrations. And the cowboy has enjoyed a surge of popularity in the last few years. I mean, for me, Lil Nas X really kicked it off with Old Town Road. And since then, Yellowstone has been one of the most popular television shows. Barbie had her iconic pink cowboy outfit. Beyonce had her whole sparkly cowboy aesthetic with Renaissance. And since then, she's leaned even heavier into it with Cowboy Carter. This ain't Texas. Ain't no hold'em. And to boot, country music at large is really topping the charts in the U.S. But I think our fascination with cowboys is bigger than all this. The cowboy is speaking to us. But what is the cowboy saying? I sat down with two incredible thinkers, Jay Wortham, culture critic for the New York Times Magazine, and Nora Burnett Abrams, director of the Museum of Contemporary Art in Denver, which had an exhibit called Cowboy. And in honor of this summary symbol, I'm revisiting our conversation from last year. So saddle up, because the three of us are diving into the cowboy's complicated history and what its image means to us now. Nora, welcome to It's Been a Minute. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Great to have you. And Jay, welcome. Thank you, longtime listener. First time appearance. So excited. (laughs) I'm excited. Y'all got me gassed up. All right. All right. Let's get to it. We are here today to talk about cowboys. The New York Times has said that we are in a cowboy era. I want to know if y'all agree. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think that we are absolutely having a cowboy moment. And I think that there's a longer history of why we're having a cowboy moment. The cowboy emerged in the middle of the 19th century, especially in the wake of the Civil War and the trauma of the battlefield and the anxiety of industrialization. And there are other kind of inflection points over the last 200 years where the cowboy has also resurfaced in a popular culture sense Hmm. in the wake of World War II. And then also certainly now in this moment where culturally through cinema, television, fashion. There are all these different ways in which the cowboy aesthetic is surfacing. And and I think it's not disconnected from coming out of a moment or responding to a moment of great anxiety that we've had over the last several years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The cowboy is such a huge symbol in the United States, as we've been discussing, even just thinking about like the Marlboro Man, like it's stood for this rugged, masculinity, the West, having a connection to nature, westward expansion that symbolizes, you know, good old American individualism, so it's called. But I also think that the concept of the cowboy has expanded in recent years to like almost be a more abstract symbol. What does the symbol of the cowboy mean? And how has it changed? Nora, I'd love to hear from you. Sure. I mean, I think that was essentially the prompt of our exhibition, which is why has this figure persisted as a character and an icon for so many years? Of course, there's the real actual lived experience of those who work with animals, who work the land, you know, who embody that role on a daily basis, which is labor that's performed by those who are certainly not necessarily white. As people like envision maybe like the John Wayne sort Mm. of cowboy. 
Yeah. And you know what? The John Wayne Cowboy was a complete invention based on dime store novels of the 19th century and Mm. experiences as promoted by productions like Buffalo Bill's Congress of the Rough Riders, you know, which toured all over this country, all over Europe and perpetuated an idea of the cowboy as savior, cowboy as hero, cowboy as white, single, Mm. you know, male (laughs) figure who saved the day. And it was based on a lot of that imagery and a lot of those performances and storytelling that Hollywood kind of picked up those threads and obviously ran with it. But the reality is that the cowboy has always been a very diverse figure, as I'm sure you all know, like in the mid-19th century, between a third and a quarter of all cowboys were either Black or Mexican. And Mm. even the name cowboy is embedded in the history of slavery because Mm. those who were watching the cattle were the enslaved men who were protecting the animals while they're you know, owners were fighting in the Confederacy. And so they weren't referred to as men. They were referred to as boys. And that's really how you get cowboys. I did not know that. The Mexican cowboy, the vaquero, is a cow man. I mean, it's not a cowboy. It's referring Mm -hmm. to a man. But Mm -hmm. in the U.S., it shifted. So all that to say that the idea of the John Wayne figure, the Clint Eastwood (laughs) figure, was such an invention. And that just kept getting narrower and narrower and narrower audiences devoured it. And I think now there's a lot more representation that speak to a a far more accurate history of the cowboy and frankly, of Mm. the American West and of the country itself. Hmm. Jay, I'd love to hear from you on this. Like, what does the symbol of the cowboy mean and, and how have you seen it change? What I'm really interested in right now is trying to understand a bit better the abstraction of the cowboy because the fascination both feels historical and ahistorical. There are lots of histories and legacies. And when we talk about cowboy here in America, we mean something really specific. Yes, we're thinking about a particular set of movies, a particular set of lineages and histories. What does it mean to be a person who then decides to put on a pair of chaps, put on a cowboy hat? Like, What are we actually celebrating and what are we trying to reclaim? And part of it, I think, is a really murky notion of freedom. It's a really interesting notion of independence. It's also an insistence on history in some ways, I think, of, you know, to Nora's point, that a quarter of American cowboys were Black, not white. And so what does it mean not to see them? Maybe that's an okay space to dream in or to think about a critical fabulation, the way Sadia Harman talks about it in Wayward Lives, Mm. beautiful experiments of trying to imagine some of these stories. And maybe that's part of what's really incredible about trying to both claim Americanness and abstract it at the same time and think about it in a way other than what we know historically, which is so terrible and violent. Maybe there are other alternate ways of being, and we have to try to embrace them in order to bring them into today. And speaking about symbolism, the cowboy is also a sex symbol. It's an enduring archetype among queer people of all genders and sexualities, thinking of like Tom of Finland and the village people. And that's just like scratching the surface. You know, and let's be real, like cowboy garb, like the getup, the chaps, the hat. I mean, I think it's kind of like hot to pretty much everyone on some level, at least in America. If there's any hope for all of us. If there's any hope. (laughs) If there's any hope for all of us. But I wonder, what does the cowboy say about American desire? Ooh, Nora. I think we as consumers of American culture very much love a strong, you know, (laughs) physically empowered being the cowboy figure almost more than any other kind of type or icon does that you know we have Dina Lawson's cowboys is one of the works in our exhibition Mm -hmm. these young men who are sitting astride their horses in the dark of a Georgia night Mm -hmm. the work is all about dissociating whiteness from the sexual allure of the cowboy. We have these three sculptures by an artist named Ken Taylor Reynaga, who's an LA-based artist who's from originally from Bakersfield, California. So his sculptures are based on kind of hats worn by those who work in the field, so to speak. And he has enhanced these hat-like forms. They're an homage to the sombreros and also the cowboy hat, and mm-hmm. they are very suggestive of the female anatomy. And I swear, 
once you uh-huh. see that connection between the cowboy hat and a vagina, you can't unsee it. Mm. Ooh, Jay, I want to hear from you. I'm like, my <laughs> mind is, y'all got my mind going just now. There is something about a cowboy that is just inherently erotic, mm-hmm. right? The definition of, or I guess the sort of ideas that come along with the definition of a cowboy is someone who is at the margins of society, who is relying on these really strong bonds with other cowboys, right? I just think there's something very unfettered that American sex doesn't naturally have. I think, you know, we are Mm -hmm. so puritanical as a culture. Sex is still so taboo. There's such a like pulling away from notions of desire and eroticism. And so there's something about no rules, no boundaries. It's Mm -hmm. just me, you, and the open road and an open sky that is just so erotic because it just feels like anything can happen. Oh, it's like spontaneity and like the element of surprise and novelty are like, that's the lifeblood of the erotic. That is the lifeblood of the romantic. Can I just say that not for nothing, but all the accoutrement of cowboy culture, ropes, leather, (laughs) things to restrain things with, boots, all of these are items that are fetishized and just widely used in BDSM and kink communities and culture. So there is just that natural overlap anyway. Like they just go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. So, so, so true. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I mean, like what is a lasso, you know? Like what is a lasso? Right. Right. Many things. Many things. (laughs) Many things. (laughs) As we've been discussing, the narrow definition of the Hollywood cowboy, that John Wayne kind of like dirty, hairy figure or whatever, doesn't include... Black cowboys. It doesn't include vaqueros. It doesn't include... Female cowboys. Yeah. It feels like a lot of the people playing with the symbol of the cowboy right now are outside of that narrow Hollywood definition who are playing with this symbol of the cowboy as like a project of reclamation. I Mm. wonder, who owns the cowboy? Oh my God. I love this question, right? Because it is almost impossible to answer right? Because, you know, listening to Nora, I'm reminded that the American term itself is foisted upon Black enslaved folks who are caring for cattle. Mm -hmm. And the term perseveres the way so many of those terms do. And so how much of that can we rework and reclaim and repurpose? I mean, that is so the American project, taking... (laughs) the trash and trying to figure out how to turn it into something that works for all of us. Like we upcycle so much of our own culture here. And it's, it's such an ongoing conversation about what is appropriation, you know, what should be left behind, what should we hold on to? So I think it's good that we don't have an answer. Right. And I think that it does allow the notion of a contemporary cowboy to, loosen itself a little bit from its historical violence and possibly reinvent itself. Mm -hmm. But I think so much of it speaks to how little we actually really know about American history and how much of it has been dominated by narratives that become embedded and concretized and permanent without us really even understanding why or what they consist of. Mm. And I, I think that's part of the conversation that maybe is starting to happen with this pop culture embrace is that aesthetics sometimes come first and then an an interest or deeper interest in what it means to embrace them. Not always. Mm. Sometimes things are just fun. But in this case, you kind of have to hope that (laughs) there is some curiosity about what it means to put on emblems and cultural signifiers that have a really, really, really long history, both in our country and others. Hmm. Yeah, I've been thinking about it myself. And I think you're right. I don't think we have an answer I think that my thought is that maybe it belongs to no one. That is something Mm. that I've been thinking about. And I think maybe that's part of the reason why it's so malleable and changeable as a symbol. It's a part of the public domain at this point. I would concur. I think it's, it's so much bigger than ownership could ever contain. I know that I'm just like, it sounds like I'm just pushing like every artist in our show, but I will say there's (laughs) one other artist I would want to introduce, which who is um, Nathan Young. His work in the show is called Activation Transformation. And what he's done is he's collected a number of different objects of material culture, photographs, boots, t-shirt, hats that are from 
his family members who have been a part of over several generations of uh, the Indian rodeo culture and specifically the Pawnee rodeo culture and, and the communities that surround that, which is to say that this is more cowboy than any cowboy in air quotes could mm. be. What his installation demonstrates is how this specific Indigenous community have been performing and competing in various types of rodeo events and and activities for generations. Nathan has said that it's kind of an urban legend in his family that one of his great uncles was the silhouette for Wrangler jeans. That I can't fact check. So I, I want <laughs> no, I mean, to be totally legend. honest about That's that. cool though. Right? It is cool. And it's fascinating because it's like yeah. the most unexpected source in a sense because we have this ridiculous binary that has been put forward in American culture of a cowboy versus an Indian, right? It's the, hmm. it, and so what his installation does is it upends that you know silly binary by showing through actual materials how cowboy his community and his family has always been. Y'all have given me so much to think about. (laughs) Nora, Jay, thank you so much for coming on the show today to talk to me about the cowboy. This was great. My pleasure. What an honor. That was my conversation from last year with New York Times Magazine critic Jay Wortham and Nora Burnett Abrams, director of the Museum of Contemporary Art in Denver. This episode of It's Been a Minute was produced by Barton Girdwood, Alexis Williams, Liam McBain, Corey Antonio Rose. This episode was edited by Jessica Placek, Bilal Qureshi. Engineering support came from Phil Ed Fors. Our executive producer is Verilyn Williams. Our VP of programming is Yolanda Sanguini. All right, that's all for this episode of It's Been a Minute from NPR. I'm Brittany Luce. Talk soon. This message comes from NPR sponsor, REI Co-op. For the next 15 seconds, REI wants to remind you that your time is precious and that getting outside to soak up summer is a precious way to spend it. Visit your local REI Co-op or REI.com slash opt outside. This message comes from NPR sponsor, Charles Schwab. Independent registered investment advisors are fiduciaries. They must act in your best interest always. That's why Schwab is proud to support them. Visit findyourindependentadvisor.com.